All right. Good morning, everybody. We're going to get things started with Heart the Herald Angels Sing. ministry how are you guys you may be seated hey you know what give each other a little bit of a high five a little bit of a hug you guys made it it is nine o'clock oh and you guys whoa Sharon and Eric you made it too way to go way to go um good to see everybody this morning oh did I die did I did I die you're in heaven check check one two is it on me or is it on you guys I don't know. Want me to just ban in this thing? Check, check. One, two, one, two. I don't know, Nathan. You can figure this thing out later. Anyway, it is great to see you guys this morning. Um, it, it is worth getting up to hang out with our friends and family. Thanks for coming to the 9 o'clock church service. Uh, those that come in at 10 o'clock, let's not make them feel so bad. <laughs> Say hello and good morning and Merry Christmas and, and hand them a cup of coffee. Um, but we're so glad that you guys are here in the Advent season. Uh, today is the candle of joy. And I got thinking about joy because I'm going to talk about it up on the mountaintop today. Uh, Nathan, Nathan is doing the sermon in here today, and I'm going to do the one up on top of the mountain because it's our first moon one. But I got to thinking about joy, and I feel like this, this is my definition of joy. Joy is the response of hope that you had in something that you cannot control. Let me say that again. Joy is a response of the hope that you had in something or have in something that is out of your control. Whereas in happiness, 
Happiness, this is the difference between joy and happiness. <coughs> happiness is the response of hope that you have in something that is in your control. You see that difference? And that's where faith comes into play. Faith in something, hope in something that is outside of your control. Right? And that's why we have true joy because we put our faith and hope in Jesus, who is the Son of God, who came to earth to love, to save us, and that's why we have joy. Happiness comes and goes because it's putting hope in things that I can control. Where joy should be something that is eternal because we have put our hope in God. And uh, that's what we're going to celebrate today. And if I saw the paper right, Nancy, are you coming up? Awesome. Is anyone else joining you? Yeah. Who else? Right yeah, this is, this, is, this is your moment. Oh, is it the gals? <laughs> Who do I got? The girls are lighting the candles. And Christine's got bells. This is amazing. Do we got the, uh, the, the, the mic? Awesome. <laughs> Jingle bells. Hello, we're here to do joy and um, like to feed off what Marcus said, joy is definitely a great feeling that's deep in your soul, deep in your soul. And of course, it's a gift from the Holy Spirit as you work through and you really see the true beauty of Jesus and is in the word and in the works. And Christmas is a great time, but we're here to remind you, you can have joy every single day. Just allow the Holy Spirit to work through you. So we'll do the Advent reading now. Can you imagine the joy Adam and Eve must have felt to walk with Christ in the Garden of Eden? They knew and experienced that Creator face to face. We can also imagine the despair they experienced when they were cast out of Eden sitting against God. Yet in his mercy, God began to restore the joy of knowing and ex experience him through a man he named Abraham and his descendants in Israel. God often leads people into trial so that we can learn to find joy in our relationship with him. He led the Israelites into captivity in Egypt for 400 years of hardship and toil. God did not forget them. He raised up Moses to lead his people out of captivity, but the evil king Pharaoh would, not, would have none of it. To free his people, God sent plagues on Egypt, even killing Pharaoh's firstborn son, a child, to the, a child the people believed to be divine. As God led the Israelites out of captivity, he parted the Red Sea so they would walk across dry land. Pharaoh chased after them, and God crashed the waves down upon Pharaoh's armies. As Moses and the Israelites stood on the far side of the Red Sea, Moses' sister, Miriam, sang a joyful song of thanksgiving for the deliverance God had brought. Sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted, both horse driver he has hurled into the sea. Just like God delivered the Israelites from bondage in Egypt, God planned to deliver his people from the even greater bondage of sin. By the power of the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary conceived a child when she was visited when she visited her relative Elizabeth, who was pregnant, Elizabeth's child leaped in her womb for joy. Jesus, the second Moses, has come to lead his people into freedom. As Mary carried the Christ child, she, like Miriam at the Red Sea, sang a joyful song of thanksgiving. My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God 
my Savior, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Now, as we light the candle of joy, we joyfully thank the Lord for sending Jesus, the one and only divine Son of God, to lead us out of our sin and captivity. Just as Moses was born and placed in a papyrus uh, basket as a baby, Jesus was placed in a wooden manger. Just as Moses led the Israelites out of captivity, Jesus let any who repent and believe in him out of captivity to sin and into the freedom of eternal life. Let us sing songs of joyful praise like Miriam and Mary this Christmas season. Also, as we celebrate the arrival of the one who will lead us home into God's presence, a second final exodus. And you already lived it. Oh, thank you. Thank you, ladies. We're going to... We're going to sing joy to the world. Let's stand and sing. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. you that joy is a gift from you. We thank you that you are the keeper of joy, and because of that, we have uh, a joy that cannot be taken from us. We thank you that, that Christ, you are the embodiment, embodiment of that. Pray this morning and the rest of this Christmas season, the season of Advent, that we would just, as joy, this song says, that, that our hearts would prepare room uh, for you to speak to us and uh, we love you, Jesus, and we pray this in your name. Amen. All right, it's announcements already. You guys may be seated. I'll try to keep this short. It's a lot coming at you. It is, is the most wonderful time of the year. So if you take your bulletins or you look up at the um, screen, here we go. Uh, one of our biggest outreaches of the year is coming up a week from tonight. Christmas Eve. It's a lot of fun. Uh, a lot of people come out that don't know the Lord. It's a really fun way. We have a couple things, three things happening on Christmas Eve. Well, actually, we have more than that. We have like five things happening on Christmas Eve. So, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. No, in the start, 
of Christmas Eve. We're going to have the church service here at 9 o'clock. It's going to kind of be a living room vibe, a living room style. It's going to be more of like a devotional. We're going to have the nativity with the kids. Um, We are going to have a hot cocoa and coffee drink bar. Help yourself. Parents, I'm warning you, there will be a lot of sugar on that table. It's Christmas Eve. And uh, which is going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a living room style. Please come. Come hang out. This is a really beautiful family that we have here. And we're excited um, to celebrate that. And then later that day, we'll have two different services. At 6 o'clock, we'll have the one at Waterville Valley uh, Community Church. If you're a part of that group and team, awesome. We love you. Uh, you can see Sharon. Uh, they need some cookies there as well. Um, you can probably see Randy or Marissa or Troy or Brooke on like logistics on how that all works. And if you could help with greet or have candles or all that good stuff down to Waterville at 6 o'clock. The 7 o'clock one is at Loon. It is indoors this year. Yeah. Yeah. We're back in the Governor's Lodge. Praise the Lord. So at 7 o'clock... We'll be in there. Bring your friends. Bring your family. If you would like to help us, there's a ton of ways to help. We have a lot of cookies to be made. Over here on the high bar over here is the cookie platters. Bring a cookie platter home. Fill it up. Bring it to uh, Christmas Eve. Be awesome if the cookies uh, were there by like 6 o'clock to help us put it out on the tables. Uh, We're going to be starting to serve cocoa and cookies at 6.30. Um, We need greeters. We need setup. We need teardown. If you're part of setup, we really need you there at 430. We gotta flip the entire governor's lodge into Christmas Eve. If you can help with teardown, it will take probably about 45 minutes after the service to put it all back together. We could really, really, really use your help. And if you are someone who uh, doesn't mind waving and standing out on the bridge this year, we have waivers that are going to welcome people in. So instead of the luminaries, Heidi has a bunch of big, old-school, cool lanterns. Maybe our Jingle Bell ladies could be part of this. You guys look pretty good at waving. Um, She's got big old lanterns that you're going to be standing on the bridge at Loon and welcoming people in as they come in and, you know, letting them know, like, we are so glad that you're here. So that is all of Christmas Eve. If I've missed anything, you can go see Heidi. She's got her hand in the air. I did miss something. Okay, if you want to help by making cookies, you could double dip. You can make cookies for the Waterville crew, and you can make cookies for the Loon crew, which would be great. If you really want to get excited, my aunt is gathering cookies in Bethel, Maine for the Sunday River service. You can make cookies for there, or you can make cookies for the Pleasant Mountain. But I would love for you guys to know that there is a Pleasant Mountain uh, Christmas Eve service. We've been praying for them. That's under our uh, group of people that we're commissioning over there. And there is one at Sunday River. I I would love to go to the Sunday River one because my dad is doing Christmas Eve at Sunday River, and that would take me right back to my childhood. Um, So Christmas Eve all around. So, so excited. Um, December 31st is the first Waterville Valley Community Church service at 10 o'clock down there. If you'd like to be part of that community, it is so cool what God is doing down there. Uh, We're so thankful here. Danielle's done an awesome job with our resource table. It's right around the corner here. All those resources are free. Please grab some. There's great devotionals. There's great, I think I saw a calendar over there. There's all kinds of stuff on the resource table. Please, please, please. Um, Over the holiday next couple weeks, maybe some of these schedules are a little bit different. If you want to be part of a small group, it's kind of right down here on all the small group stuff we do. Um, If you are normally part of a small group, check out with your leader if maybe there's some kind of Christmas week change of things. Um, But during Christmas week, uh, as you know, uh, at Price Chopper, and as you know, at when you're trying to pull out on the main street, it's going to be very busy. Maybe this year, prayerfully, instead of being like, why is everybody in Price Chopper? Oh, why can't I pull out on main street? Be like, oh, everyone's here. I want to say hello and get to know them and, and tell them that I love them and that they're here, um, which is really cool. I think that's a lot for now, so I think we're going to be good. Did I miss anything? Awesome. Or, we'll yes. say. Oh, we got, okay, awesome. Oh, yeah, you told me something. What was it, Sharon? Oh, you didn't tell me anything. All right, Sharon Bartlett.
Yeah. That is so cool. Thank you very much, Monday morning, ladies crew. Drew had something. Oh, I was. This is probably really important, but I was gonna say if if you are gonna drop off cookies here, just be sure not to drop them off in Nathan Meyer Marcus's office. <laughs> very important. They might not make it to Some Christmas Eve. Two hundred and fifty pound mice back there. <laughs> <laughs> um. Is that anything else? <laughs> uh, is this is where all. kiddos get dismissed? I believe so. All yes. right, kiddos. If you are under three feet tall, you go that way. If you're between three feet and four feet, you go this way. <laughs> is that how that goes? I think so. <laughs> all right. We are back on the mountain for the first time this winter season. So uh, in celebration of that, we're going to sing Go Tell It on the Mountain. I'll invite you to stand and sing. Go tell it on the mountain, over the hills and everywhere. Go tell it on the mountain that Jesus Christ is born. While shepherds kept their watching, or silent flocks by. in scripture reading. <laughs> um, the scripture reading was conditional on whether or not I had my readers. Thankfully I do because it's a long one. <laughs> uh, today's reading is from Ephesians 1, 9 and 10 and Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Feel free to read along or listen. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the, of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But because of his great love for us, 
God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do so. Hear me? No. Is this thing running? No. Mark, are we bailing? Are we bailing? Check, 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 check. All right, then we're going to bail on it. Somebody right. unplugged it. Huh? It looks like somebody unplugged it. Well, here, I'll do this. I'll use this microphone until it gets really loud. And then, now is it working? Ah, ha, ha, ha. Thank you, Mark. All right, here, I'll put that down right there. Awesome. Well, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it is um, awesome, awesome to be here and to share with you guys. Um, it has been a busy week. I don't know about you guys, but if you have uh, been in the Christmas, I feel like I've been in the Christmas season for at least three months now um, because my wife really loves Christmas, which is awesome. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm excited um, as, uh, as we get to dig deeper into, you know, when you spend three months in something, you, you often learn the nuances of it. And so I hope that's where I'm, I'm getting to. Um, but uh, this week as I was um, preparing, you know, if you've been around, you know we're going through the book of Ephesians. Um, if, you, if you're here and uh, you're more of the evangelical Christian persuasion, uh, you're very familiar with a couple of these verses. In fact, these are probably the verses that identify um, Protestants all around the world, um, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, right? We're, we're probably all pretty familiar with those verses. Um, but as I was thinking about uh, what to share this week, um, it was uh you know, reminded to me um, by Facebook, because Facebook, you know, they do the yearly reminders, um, but also just the general, um, you know, we were, I was in a very different place a year ago today. Um, if you guys were around a year ago, um, and, uh, and you knew my, my, myself or my wife, you knew uh, that she had just gotten in a serious, serious accident um, a year ago. On technically on Friday, it was December fifteenth of twenty twenty two. I was at home on a Monday, or no, sorry, a Thursday. Thursday is typically kind of our day off. Um, I was at home watching the kids. They were sleeping, but <laughs> doing my dadly duties. Um, I was watching the kids while they were sleeping, and and Eunice was off with some friends up at Loon snowboarding. Um, it's a passion that we've shared uh, ever since I first uh, knew her. We snowboard quite a lot, and I I love that she gets to do that with her friends. So she got out on the slopes with a couple of friends, which I know they're both here, um, and you know out of the blue you know, took a fall and hit her head. And um, granted, I'm at home and, and just doing some different errands around the house and whatnot. Um, and uh, I got a couple of phone calls that I missed from Zena here. And then I got a, co- a phone call from my mother-in-law, Cindy, who's also here. Um, and, uh, and immediately the mood changed when she said, Eunice has been in an accident. You need to call Zena pretty sure. Unfortunately, I, I hung up on you. I'm sorry, Cindy. I didn't, I don't even think I said goodbye. I just like hung right up and I called Zena. Um, and on the phone uh, with Zena, um, she shared with me that, that Eunice took a fall. And she, was having a, she was having a really hard time even expressing what she had experienced um, in watching her sister go down on the slopes and go unconscious. Um, it wasn't long after that that she handed the phone over to Ski Patrol. Ski Patrol then uh, was able to communicate to me 
she went down. She um, she had a uh, she she was unconscious. She had a seizure, and she's been unconscious for 15 minutes. So, as a husband, um, I went from an accident to uh, unconscious to possible traumatic brain injury. You know, it, it's interesting the wave of emotions that you go through uh, when you get a phone call like that. Um, I don't know how many of you guys have had a phone call. I, I hope the world that that does not happen to you, but inevitably life um, has those moments. And, uh, and it was interesting as I, as I processed through um, what was happening because you're like, okay, this is now where we're at. My wife, you know, is still unconscious. She's, she's been unconscious for a long time, much longer than, than uh, what, um, I almost said what is recommended. It's not, a, it's not recommended to be unconscious for any amount of time, but, but a lot longer than, than, um, than is, is maybe more normal for a typical concussion. Um, and so all of a sudden, you know, I had had a friend um, in, he was a friend in high school. I didn't know him super well, but he had had a traumatic brain injury and I didn't see him for maybe 10 years. And I saw him 10 years later and he was in a wheelchair and he could do very little. Um, and that was the case where someone lived. There are many other people who don't live. And so I'm in a place where I'm like, okay, well, the worst thing that could happen is death because this ski patroller is telling me on the phone she needs to get airlifted. Um, if any of you guys, you know, if you're around here, you know the term or the phrase darted. Um, to be darted, it's to be taken by helicopter to Dartmouth Hospital. It's something they only do for the most extreme of cases. Um, I, I don't know all the statistics for how often they come to town, but um, maybe a couple times a year they come, and, uh, and it's life or death situation. So as soon as she said, or he said, um, that she was uh, going to be darted, all of a sudden it was uh, it was really, really, really serious for me. And so, um, now it was interesting is while, you know, essentially if there's like a bar of like, okay, where are we at with this situation? If the lowest is like death, the worst possible scenario, and the highest is, um, you know, she's perfectly fine, there's nothing wrong with her, um, I was down here. And while I was on the phone with the ski patroller, he told me, oh, she's starting to respond. She's saying a couple words. And so all of a sudden, it was bumped up a little bit. Now, I'm still sitting here like, what do I do? What do I do? I'm like, do I come to Loon? Um, you know, he's like, don't even bother. Just get to Dartmouth. Um, meanwhile, of course, I'm at home with the kids. I was the only one there. So I had to figure that out. So hang up. So all I know is, okay, she's, she's, I'm, I'm down, I'm from here to, okay, it seems like she's responding, that's awesome, but there's still a lot, a lot that can be wrong. Um, and so, so I, um, I get on the phone with my mother-in-law, she comes over graciously. I can't imagine, um, Cindy, the pain it must have been for you to not rush to the hospital yourself and to come and watch our kids, thank you um, for that. And, uh, and, and I'll never forget the hug that I shared with, um, with Cindy that day as I left for the hospital. And I left from there. Now, keep in mind, I'm still like, okay, she's responded, but that's all I know. Um, I'm on the drive, um, and I get another phone call. Well, Eunice, um, when you, the protocol when, when you get darted from somewhere, you uh, take an ambulance from Loon, to the school, the front field, where there's an area that you can be airlifted out of. Um, she is taken in the ambulance. Of course, um, you know, Eunice's family is very uh, much around here and very well known because of uh, how long they've been here. Um, and in fact, 50% of the audience is probably related. Um, <laughs> and uh, and she, gets, she gets taken to the school. And um, at that time, the middle school ski team practice was getting out, which Marcus coaches. And, uh, of course, all the kids, you know, who maybe are less aware of what it means to be darted are like, oh, cool, a helicopter. And all the parents are like, let's, you know, let's, let's be courteous, you know, and kind to them. Like, th we know something really serious is happening. Um, I was told at that point that Marcus got a phone call to, um, that that was Eunice in, uh, in the ambulance. So he rushed down, met with the ambulance people who all were, or the, the people who were going to take her, didn't really know who this person was. They bring bodies from Loon 
to the field or from li or f down to the hospital all the time, they don't, most of the people, they don't really know. Um, and all of a sudden, it was one of them. It was a local. It was, it was somebody from Lincoln and Woodstock that uh, either they knew personally or somebody that was in close relation to them. And so all of a sudden, the mood changed, and Marcus, expecting to pick up a dead body or, or, a, or a lifeless body maybe out of uh, the ambulance, was greeted by Eunice talking with him. Um, uh, and he, I guess, when he called me, he told me, hey, she, she's, she's with it. She talked to me, and she's now on, on, the, um, on, the, on the flight to Dartmouth. And he tells me that as I was passing over, it was kind of unique. I was passing over the same spot that we actually got engaged at up at Beaver Pond um, on Kinsman Notch. And so I, I all of a sudden, okay, I got a little bit more. I got a little bit more hope. There's a little bit more. And so I'm slowly working my way up this ladder. I get to Dartmouth. I see her. I couldn't do really anything other than just like break down. And she's, of course, she's in her, you know, neck brace. And she looks over and she's like, why are you crying? I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> like, what do you mean? Like you and and. um and little by little throughout that night, Zena came and, and, and hung out with us for the night but um, at the hospital. But little by little, uh, doctor by doctor, good news, good news, good news. And um, all of a sudden, I went from a place of, of thinking that my wife could be dead, that I could be a single father with two kids. Um, my wife, while not 100%, she, she had a, a major concussion, was, was here and with me, and I'm so thankful that she is with me a year later. And for whatever reason, in that scenario, God granted a grace to me that uh, was, it wasn't necessarily that we deserved it or didn't deserve it. You see, the world that we live in today, um, whether you do something wrong and you directly receive, you know, repercussions for that, or it's just the, the, the randomness of life and the fact that we live in a fallen world where sin disease, or disease and, and, and natural disasters and all these things happen and it might not be anybody's. I think the, the wrong conversation is whose fault is this? Did you do something wrong? It's the Job, Job's friends, right? They come in to meet Job who's just lost everything and they say, well, what did you do wrong? <laughs> What did you do wrong to deserve this? And it's, it's a wildly, like, a misunderstanding of the situation and just, and just being there and comforting. And so in that moment, we received God's grace in a beautiful way. So my wife is here. Now, that's not always, yes, thank you. That is amazing. If you know my wife, you probably really love her, and I love her very much. But that's not always the case. God doesn't just extend grace when things go well, when the, the doctor's reports were, were positive. There's another person here in this audience today who had a different story. And maybe God's grace wasn't as obvious. I, I spoke with Nancy earlier this week about this, but, but her story is so powerful, not because God's grace was shown to her in the moment of her tragedy, it was, uh, it was four years ago that her husband, Jeff, passed away suddenly. Where is God's grace in a moment like that? And I've been, I've been so blessed and encouraged, and if you've known Nancy over these years, you've been so blessed and encouraged to see her operate in the place of God's grace on her life, not because Jeff had the positive news like my wife did, but because God had grace on her through the gift of Jesus. And uh, we're, we're in the passage that we're in, and the reason I bring up grace is this is the grace passage. And um, I want to take a moment um, to, to step kind of out of maybe this, this topic of grace and, and, and spend a couple moments on these verses 1 through 10 um, as we go through Ephesians. Um, and then we'll, we'll come back to uh, how it is that grace makes such a big difference. And so uh, we'll look at verses one through three. The easiest way to break up these first 10, or these first 10 passages, first 10 verses of uh, chapter two is by going one through three 
and then 4 through 10. And instead, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you, but essentially it's bad news, good news, right? Um, when it comes to sharing the good news of Jesus and the grace that God extended through his son Jesus, we can never know the goodness of that without knowing the bad news first, right? A couple weeks ago, I talked a little bit about the state of the human heart. It speaks of that in Romans. It speaks of that in the Old Testament, how nobody is righteous, is that all fall short. No one seeks God. No one looks for him. And we all like to prop ourselves up thinking that God's going God's gonna to accept me because I show up at church or because I help the, you know, the elderly or because I'm a good parent or whatever, you name it. I read my Bible. Um, but the fact is, is that we've all fallen short. In these verses, it says uh, uh, the, these were kind of the, the key things that I picked out. We were dead in our sin. Now, this is talking past tense. We were dead in our sin. We walked with, within that. We followed the wrong things, the wrong people. We all once lived in that. And then finally, it ends with probably the scariest of all those phrases is that we were children of wrath. In other words, we were under the wrath of God, the punishment of God for our sins. Now, that's not just your neighbor who thinks things differently than you. That is each and every one of us. We talk about this a lot. Jesus came not just to save you from, or, uh, you from your sin, but he saved you from yourself. We say that a lot here, is that, is that the problem isn't the people who disagree with you. God didn't just come to save your political neighbor who you disagree with. He came to save you from you and yourself. I love this because, um, you know, the, the, the reason for going into why, the, the place of where we are, the, the, the bad news is, is because it makes the good news that much greater. And so in verse 4, we move forward to the good news. Now, it doesn't say this. This is the NIV um, up on your screen. In the ESV, I love how verse 4 starts. It's, it, it, it begins with this, we're dead in sin. This is who we once were. And then it says, but God. But God. I think this, that like just thinking those two words, when, I, when I'm going through a difficult season, whether it was what I was, you know, what we were going through as a family with Eunice, um, Eunice's, uh, her injury, um, or, or if it's just the day-to-day. This morning, I was back in the office um, trying to prepare for the sermon, and there's just so many things that happen to make this service happen, and all of a sudden, in me, I could feel this, like, knot of, like, I'm just like, oh, I'm like, there's this stress in me or whatever, and it was all me, me, my struggles, God, and as I was praying, and I was reminded of what I was about to preach in an hour was, but God, but God. So we say, but God, what do we find in verses 4 to 10? He was rich in mercy, verse 4. He made us alive with Christ, verse 5. He raised us up. In other words, he's given us all the things that Jesus earned, and he gave them freely to us as a gift. If we point back to chapter 1, I don't have this um, on the slides, Back in chapter 1, it says we are God's inheritance. It says that God's inheritance is actually the saints, those who love and follow Jesus. So we actually are the gift to God. I love this. Um, it was a couple years ago I studied this. Uh, it was one of the earliest missions movements uh, out of Germany um, that, that was missional like towards the, the ends of the earth, maybe outside of like Paul. Um, but it was a church in Germany called the Moravian Church, and, um, and they were famous for sending missionaries all over the world. Well, t- there's two young kids, um, early 20s, who, who felt called to this uh, slave island off of the coast of Africa, and they knew that the only way to get onto this island to share the gospel with these slaves who uh, had, a, had you know, a, a slave owner who was an atheist— the only way they'd ever hear about the good news of Jesus is if somebody went there, but the only way for somebody to get there would be for them to, for, to sell themselves into slavery. And so they, they sell themselves into slavery, these two guys. It's the last they're ever heard of again. They went to the island, and, and we don't know the rest of the story. But as they were leaving, they said this out loud from the boat. They said, may the lamb that was slain receive the reward for his suffering 
the people on that island, whether it be the slaves or the slave owners, were the inheritance of God. So now we were dead in our sin. We, were, we walked in it. We followed the wrong things. We all once lived there and we were children of wrath. But God, who was rich in mercy, but God, who had great love for us, but God, he made us alive with Christ, but God, he raised us up. And God made us an inheritance. We are the treasure that he gets to receive. Now, that's not because we're super special. That's not because we have a ton to bring to the table. But God and his love, it's so, it's so challenging to think about because I, when, I, when I express these things, I'm like, I'm like, but I have to be careful because we don't actually, we don't inherently have value apart from the value that God puts in us. We don't bring things to the table. This whole passage is about how God did it and not we, not us. And then we get to the, the famous passages, uh, the famous verses, 8 through 9. Pull that up here. 8 through 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, not of your own doing, but the gift, for, but the gift of God. And then in verse 9. Is it going to come up? Maybe. There you go. Not by work so that no one can boast. There is no boasting because we did none of the work. It was God's grace to save us. In verse 10, it talks about how we're now the handiwork of God. God molds us into who he desires. That doesn't mean we're going to all look the same. We all have unique ways that God molds us and we become his handiwork. But we're the handiwork of God. And so it was God's grace that saved us, and it's also God's grace that's going to mold us into who he desires us to be. Now, when I think of this grace, because I, I, I want to I just not isolate passages. I think it's really important as you read your Bibles, don't isolate a group of, a group of verses and then just say, oh, this is what this means. Make sure to look at it in the context of, of, the, cha- of the whole book. Um, so in, ver- in chapter 1, um, Paul brings up uh, this, this thing, which I think it kind of it influences a lot of the rest of the book in verses 9 and 10, which is the, the passages on your bulletins there. I think it's up here somewhere. Um, or I'll have, I'll have Tracy, if you just get to verse, chapter 1, verses 9 and 10. Paul says that there's a mystery of God's will. He brings up this mystery. There's a mystery of of God's will. Uh, chapter one, these are, this is chapter two. He says, the mystery of God's will is to unite all things in him. To unite all things in him. The mystery, verse nine, the mystery of his will, and then it goes on, Paul does a lot of run-ons, but according to his good pleasure, and then he finishes to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. To bring unity to all things. What's, been, what's beautiful is he unpacks this in different ways throughout the book. A little later on, Paul's going to unpack how there's unity between Jews and non-Jews or Gentiles or Greeks. Uh, Marcus brought them up last week. Um, there's unity between them. But right here, he's saying all things are unified under God, and, that's, and this is how broken human beings are unified to a perfect and holy God. Now, um, on this... Uh, this last slide, I, I talked about this last night um, at a Christmas party I was at, but um, it got me thinking of the nativity when I thought of the grace of God being displayed in a person of Jesus. Um, so I have a little, wherever it is, this thing like hardly works. Just get to the, get to the, you know, the baby Jesus on there. When I think of the nativity, yeah, I get to the baby Jesus. <laughs> perfect, perfect. This is Christmas time, and so we see a lot of images of baby Jesus. We see a lot of nativities around. It's a wonderful decoration to have in your home. Um, and we're about to see just an overwhelming amount of cuteness next week at the nativity at the Christmas Eve service. And uh, as I was thinking about the nativity, um, you know, I often don't think of the depths of, of the importance of this little child it, it, it's chalked up to something that's cute that, that is a nice decoration around our homes, and it's like, Jesus is the reason for the season. And that, that's absolutely true, but, but that usually doesn't dig deeper into my heart. And what really stuck out to me, and it came from um, a devotion that uh, my wife gave me called uh, Come Let Us Adore Him by Paul Tripp. I'd highly recommend it. And uh, this, 
this one thing he talked about. He was talking about grace and how grace wasn't just something, like grace was displayed in the, in the person of Jesus. God wasn't just extending an attribute to us, um, as these verses say. He was extending a person to us. And Paul Tripp really uh, hits, like I think he, he describes it super, super well. And so he says this, this season... In the midst of all the celebrations and the gift giving, be careful to remember that at the center of what we celebrate in one is one game changing, life altering, hope giving reality. Grace is a person and his name is Jesus. God knew that nothing else would ever repair what sin had broken. So he gave us the ultimate gift of gifts, the gift of his son. It's not to say, or it's not enough to say that Jesus came to preach grace to us. It's not enough to say that he came to give grace to us. No, Jesus is God's redeeming grace, given to those who without him would have no hope in life or in death. Now that's we're celebrating, not just one special day of the year, but on every day of our, our lives and for the rest of eternity too. As I began to look at the baby Jesus in, in the nativities this year, I, and, and I, in, in light of, of him being the grace gift of God to us, I was reminded that, that this child was the expression of what I needed in everything and every way. I'm talking about grace today, but as we think about even the candles of hope and love and joy and peace, he, ex- he is the expression of those. And so, so if, that's, if that's the case, there is no true hope, there is no true peace, there is no true joy, there is no true love apart from this little child, from this little child that was sent to earth where God became man, Emmanuel, God with us. There is no grace apart from the, the person who, who, who personifies grace, which is Jesus. And as I think about the mystery of grace, it reminds me of, uh, you know, in, in our Western culture, the most often uh, pushback to belief in God is, how could a loving God send people to hell? How could a loving God... How could a loving God allow evil in this world? How could a loving God allow those things? But the question, and as I think of the mystery of grace, the question flips on its head, and it's how could a just God extend grace and mercy to those who don't deserve it? How could a just God extend grace and mercy to those who don't deserve it? That is the mystery of grace. That is the mystery of grace. And so whether you're in a position like, like Eunice and I and, and our family and, and a lot of you in our church who were, were really a part of that, whether you were in that position where the doctor said a lot of good news, yes, we, we were extended grace from God and the fact that she had these positive, positive things come back, but, but ultimately our grace is in this little child. And Nancy, who had the worst news come to her, same thing, her grace is in that child. So I want to encourage us this morning um, to lay our hope in the grace that God offers, not in, in maybe all the things that this world. Marcus was saying it earlier, you know, when, when our hope and love and joy is placed in something that we can control or, or, that, or you know, that, that the world has some level of control over, then ultimately those, those things will ultimately they, they, they won't be everlasting. They won't last beyond. But, but, but hope and love and joy and peace and grace that comes from Jesus, it goes on for eternity. It lasts. It is everlasting. So I hope today we can find grace in the work of Jesus. Let's pray. God, um, we thank you for the coming of Jesus. We thank you for what it means that, um, that you became human, that you entered into your creation for the purpose of saving it. You were the only one that could do that. Help us, Lord, as we, uh, as we celebrate this Christmas season to know, to know that apart from this child coming to this world, 
There is no hope for us. Paul says it. If there's no, if there's no resurrection of the dead, if Jesus didn't raise, then all of, all of, our, all of our, our belief, all of our, our, our celebrations and practice and, and worship service are, for, are in vain. But our hope has to be in, in, in who... Uh, in who you came as, in, in, this, in, in the Son of God, in Jesus, in Emmanuel, that you are with us. Help us, Lord, to rest our faith and our hope in him. We pray this in your Son, Jesus' name. Amen. Stand and sing, what child is this? It is and always will be and always has been about Christ, and he is the source of, of all joy, peace, hope, and love. So thank you for the encouragement. I uh, hope you guys have a great, blessed day. Hunker down for all this rain that's coming. Um, go in peace to love, serve, and enjoy the Lord.